So this is the 2020 Brown Bag Lunch and Learn series, and it's put together by a group of partners, and that includes the City of Birmingham Stormwater, Jefferson County Stormwater Program, Leeds, Alabama Stormwater Management Authority, the Alabama Green Industry, Alabama Cooperative Extension, Jefferson County Department of Health, and the Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens. And what we all do is we take in all of your suggestions that we usually collect in person on your um, surveys, but you also should be getting digital surveys now where you can suggest different topics to us. We go through your whole, the whole entire list. We pick about 14 topics every year, and then we try to find the best speakers for you all on those topics. So please, we would really appreciate it if y'all would fill out the survey after um, this presentation when it gets mailed out to you um, later this week. And just a reminder, since we are talking about fruits today, and we can't have fruits without, um, pollination. So be responsible. Um, insecticides don't pick and choose. Insecticides kill all insects, including our food pollinators. So be really careful about the insecticides that you're using in your garden, um, because without the pollinators, we don't get all these wonderful fruits that Gary is going to talk to us about today. And stop sharing. And I'm just going to give you a basic introduction today. So Gary, Gary Gray is a regional extension agent with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, serving the commercial horticultural industry. He holds an MS in agronomy from Auburn University and a BS in biology from UAB. He has worked with Alabama Cooperative Extension for 26 years, focusing primarily on fruit and vegetable production and research. He has served as an educational advisor to the Alabama Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association Board of Directors for the past 20 years. Prior to extension, Gary and his wife Becky worked four years as agricultural missionaries in the Philippines teaching sustainable farming practices to limited resource and tribal farmers. He enjoys teaching the Alabama Master, Gar Master Gardener fruit and vegetable classes and his interests include edible wild plants, tropical fruits, fly fishing, playing blues, harp, and bass guitar with Becky and friends. And Gary and Be Becky currently live in Shelby County and his extension office is located in the C. Beatty Hanna Horticultural and Environmental Center at the Birmingham Botanical Gardens. And I just want to say thank you, Gary, for stepping in today and leading this class on fruits. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever attended any of Gary's classes, but he usually has stuff for you to taste when he talks about fruit. So we're really missing out on that part. Um, but it's always a pleasure to have you. And I'm going to cut my video off and mute myself in a little bit so that you can get started. Um, just a reminder to everyone that you can go to your chat and on your chat feature, click all panelists and attendees. You can type in questions or comments there and interact with each other. We also have the Q&A function on the side where you can ask questions that Gary will be able to look at and either answer during his presentation or we might wait until the end. It just depends on how everything is going. But please don't hesitate to ask any questions. We are here to help you and talk to you all. So thank you. Well, good morning, class. <laughs> it's good to be uh, with you this morning, even if we are together virtually. And like Don said, it's always more fun when we're in person because we get to taste whatever fruits are ripe and being harvested in the day. This particular one is our um, Callaway crab apples getting ripe here at the Botanical Gardens. And uh, you'll just have to watch me eat them and judge by my facial expressions <laughs> whether it's one you want to plant at home. Uh, but no, just a little show and tell there. And um, I always try to bring a weird fruit, too, to teach about this particular one. I don't know if you recognize that, but it's um, tropical fruit. We don't grow this in Alabama, but it's tamarind and uh, sour, sweet and sour. It's a good fruit. We grew it in the Philippines, and it's a family favorite. We're going to talk a lot about some of the fun stuff. Uh, if you like fruit, I'm kind of a fruit geek, and you'll pick up on that. 
and I hope you are too. <laughs> We're going to talk about some of my favorites, some of the things that are easy to grow. I'll share my screen with you now. And uh, one other thing I'll show before I share my screen, just show and tell, I'll show this in a slide, but this is a Clemson fruit bag or peach bag and uh, has a nice little wire twist tie in it. It's a waxy bag, notch that fits right over the fruit. You just, if you want to cover an apple or peach or nectarine with this, it helps you to not have to spray for insects and diseases uh, as much. So uh, you can put it right over the fruit and twist, a little twist there, and uh, cover that fruit. And, it, and it's a nice way to protect your fruit if you want to grow organically without sprays uh, on some of our fruits. So sharing my screen now, um, let's see if we can get this show the way we want it to work. Just let me know if uh, you're able to see my screen. Dawn, is that showing up? It is showing up on my end. Good, good. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so the title of this presentation is Growing Fruit Made Easy. And um, I like the sound of that um, because I do like to talk about the ones that are easier to grow and trying to make it as easy as possible. Um, but it reminds me of the, there's a meme or a, you might have seen a graphic t-shirt with a Star Wars uh, graphic on there, Darth Vader, and he's inviting you to the dark side. He says, come to the dark side. We have cookies. And on the back side of the t-shirt, it says, we lied about the cookies. <laughs> so this is kind of, um, well, I might have lied about the easy part, but uh, I think, um, I think uh, we can talk about making fruit growing easy. If I can get my slide to advance, we'll be doing good. Let's see here. There we go. So uh, we're going to try to make it as easy as possible. Now, um, I hope you grow fruit at home, and uh, if you do, then you will appreciate some of these experiences. You know, why, why grow homegrown fruit? Uh, we, we like to grow it because we can just walk out in the yard and pick fruit, and we have flowers and vegetables and things like that, but we enjoy eating the fruit the most, and so it's just really pleasant to walk out in the yard and get fresh fruit and we can grow the varieties that we like and get the really the best flavor because they're at the peak of ripeness and so you know just getting that ideal acid sugar ratio some people like their plums green and sour and some people want them ripe and sweet and so you grow it at home you get it just like you want the best nutrition too because that fruit is as fresh as it gets and so we love to grow uh and pick fresh, cook, but also preserving. We do a lot of drying and freezing and canning and, and uh, wine making and juice and ciders, just so many things you can do if you grow the fruit. And, uh, and if you love wildlife, you will attract wildlife when you plant fruit. And that can be a, a blessing and a, and a curse, sort of a mixed blessing there. But we do get some beautiful aesthetics uh, just the beauty of fruit in the landscape, the colors, the fall colors. And for us, we enjoy seeing the wildlife out there as well. And so a lot of, a lot of reasons to grow fruit at home. If you like fruit and you like trying different varieties, one thing I always love to encourage people to do is come out to our Chilton Research and Extension Center in August. We have a field day. We used to call it the Expo. Now we call it showcase in agriculture and fruit tasting. And we'll have sometimes hundreds of varieties of fruit. Uh, we've had as many as 60 varieties of peaches that you could taste on that day, as well as nectarines, watermelons, grapes, muscadines, figs, apples, pears, Asian pears, blackberry lemonade, and on and on. So as well as vegetables, um, tomatoes, different things. So that's a great way to come out, taste a variety of fruit, decide which one you really want to grow at home. And, uh, and there are a lot of fruit that we can grow in Alabama. Um, you know, Alabama is a great place for growing fruit. We do have some heat and humidity that make for some challenges, but uh, you can see on this list, uh, we're going to talk about all of these different things that we can grow in Alabama. Some, some easy uh, and some more difficult and some more unusual. And so some of these on this list, you may not be as familiar with, uh, and uh, we'll talk about just a wide variety of things today. 
or even more uh, that uh, you might not have thought about growing in Alabama, like bananas, but we do have some banana cultivars, varieties that, cultivar means a cultivated variety. So we have some varieties that uh, we can fruit in Alabama. We have some fruiting here at the Botanical Gardens even now. So all fruits do require care. And, uh, you know, uh, these are the basic things that we're going to need to provide irrigation, fertility, some training and pruning, and fruit thinning, some mulching and weed control. On um, some fruits, they need frost protection. Uh, that would certainly be for those early bloomers like blueberries and plums. Um, on our, something like if you wanted to grow apricots, they're very early bloomers. And so um, frost protection is something we consider uh, on things like strawberries, for example. Uh, and then of course we have pest management and, and a variety of different uh, things like sanitation and cleaning up to reduce diseases. So some of the fruits that we can grow in Alabama and we grow quite well are uh, high maintenance. And that means you're just gonna have to do more work uh, you're going to have to be pretty diligent to grow uh, peaches, uh, perhaps plums, certainly nectarines, bunch grapes. Those are more likely to require more pest management and uh, more difficult to grow organically. Uh, but they can be grown with the right care, and I'm always glad to help you with that. That's what I enjoy doing. If you want to grow fruits, I will encourage you to contact me. Now, some people say babies are born in the cabbage patch or they come from the cabbage patch. Well, our kids probably came from the strawberry patch because they spent most of their childhood in the strawberry patch. Um, and, uh, and strawberries for us at home was hard. Uh, one of the ones that are higher maintenance, more difficult to grow. And we had a strawberry patch you pick right across the road from our house. So it was very easy uh, for us to get uh, strawberries from our friend who had the U-Pick. And so um, as a result, it just was a family tradition for us and our family, kids and relatives to come over and we would go to the strawberry patch and pick and then can, make strawberry preserves and anything you can think of could be made out of strawberries. We, but we'd let them do the hard work on, on the strawberries and for the most part. Um, Another one that I absolutely love are plums and, uh, and the pluots and plum apricot crosses, peaches, cherries, nectarines. Those are some wonderful fruit that we can grow in Alabama, but uh, they are challenging. And so uh, things like plum curculio and brown rot, bacterial spot, different diseases that we have challenges with. Um, and uh, yet with the right information and, uh, uh, and proper care, we can grow those. Uh, one example uh, or a way to grow those more difficult fruit like peaches or nectarines or plums, apples, is bagging. And, um, and so I showed you the, the Clemson fruit bag earlier. This, uh, this particular bag is a good one. I'll show you some, uh, some of that in a little bit. But this is uh, just some early uh, attempts and research that we did uh, bagging fruit and um, and we, we did have good success with keeping uh, insects and diseases as well as uh, birds uh, and deer off of the fruit. And so fruit bagging is a pretty good option, although it takes time, but so does, uh, so does spraying your trees. So um, this is an example of the Clemson fruit bags that I showed earlier uh, on a peach tree. And uh, uh, an individual peach tree might fruit some 400 fruit. So you can imagine tying 400 bags on a tree is going to take you a while, uh, but it is, uh, it's a pretty surefire way to get some fruit off your tree. Uh, you know, even if you spray a tree with insecticides and fungicides to try to control insects and diseases, the fruit is still susceptible to birds and deer and raccoons and so these fruit bags actually uh, are a pretty good deterrent to birds, for example, and uh, so uh, a, a nice thing to consider if you want to grow some of those more difficult fruits. Now, bunch grapes are a wonderful fruit, but not an easy one to grow because of a lot of diseases. And so we've got some um, uh, various diseases uh, in bunch grapes like anthracnose and Pierce's disease and root knot nematodes and other bunch rots. And so something like Pierce's disease, um, 
Hey, Gary, your audio is breaking up. breaking up over here um yeah it's still breaking up on my end if anyone in the participants are y'all having some breakup and connection on your end if you are just let me know in the chat section or raise your hand okay i have a couple of raised hands they're getting a couple of breaking up on your end. Can you hear me clearly, people? Okay. Try talking again, Gary. Okay, we're going to just test one, two, three. I don't know if you can hear that. That's I'm better sure. on my end. I'm not sure what was going mm -hmm. on, but it broke up when you started this slide. Okay. And everyone else says it's back now. Okay. No telling, but maybe closing the program helped. Um, okay. Well, look, just let me know again if, if that is a problem. And um, But so with that, just moving on, we have Pierce's disease resistant varieties. And now my, let's see if I can get my... Uh, and uh, then we have the problem of fruit rots on bunch grapes. So a lot of, of different diseases. And, uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about some grape varieties that are more disease resistant and easier to grow. But just if you're going to grow bunch grapes, you're going to have some challenges. So here are a couple of varieties that we've grown recently uh, at our Children's Research and Extension Center that we like. Um, well adapted. Victoria Red. Belanto is a grape. Favorite and Chanel. All of those oh, are okay. nice. doing it again. Do you have a cell phone near your computer or anything? Um, I do have a cell phone, yeah. Let's see if I can you know, turn it off. Um, I'm not sure if that's what's causing it, but I'm getting also a little bit of feedback. All right, let, how about now? How right now it's good. So I just, I'm, I just realized Wi Fi was turned on. And I just turned that off. And, oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. All right. The other thing is I'm going to turn this phone off. Okay. Um, so maybe that'll get us in better shape. Uh, now, so those are several varieties that are worthy if you want to grow bunch grapes. Now, I would say we're going to talk a little bit about muscadines in a bit, which are much easier, better adapted. Um, and uh, so here are some fruits that are easier to grow. We just talked about some that are a little higher maintenance. These are easier to grow, and these are the ones we want to spend our time on today. Um, varieties like uh, oil persimmons, figs, muscadines, uh, pineapple guava, pomegranate, mulberry, uh, resistant apples and pears. So those are some of the kinds of things we're about to talk about. Here's a little quiz for you. Um, we like to walk in the woods and you know camp and forage and things like that. And 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 so one of the my favorite fruits is this one. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, that is red mulberry, and uh, it is a wonderful fruit that we um, that that I really look for a lot in May and June. It's generally uh, a, a ripe and, and um, in our woods in Alabama, or if you have, uh, uh, in, you know, any uh, woods around your place, you know, you, you might have this one. It has a very large uh, leaf and is easy to spot. Here's another one. I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but uh, we 
have this one as well uh, throughout our woods in Alabama, along creek banks especially, and um, and here this was taken here at the Botanical Gardens. We have, paw, this is pawpaw. It's our largest uh, native North American fruit. And, um, and, and I, I like it. Uh, it has a sort of banana custard like flavor and, uh, and a really strong fragrance of bananas. Um, so just, a, I personally think it's a very nice fruit. So, I wonder if you recognize this fruit. It looks kind of weird. It looks like frog eggs. Uh, you might think that's totally weird, but now you might recognize it. Uh, as kids, we call this maypop, and uh, you might be familiar with it as passion fruit or passion vine, passion flower. Um, and it, uh, you know, grows throughout Alabama. I don't uh, recommend people just go and plant this in a, um, maybe, uh, you know, in their garden or something, um, because it is weedy, it spreads uh, underground. And, um, but if you have, a, you know, a fence or something like that, or a place for it um, that's out of the way, um, it actually is a nice fruit. Now, if you pick them green like this and break it open, um, it'll be so sour, it'll curl your toes. But if you let the fruit turn sort of a slight yellowish color and pale yellow, and they'll fall to the ground as well, you can uh, eat them and they'll be a nice sweet and sour kind of mix. I really like. And they're full of seeds, which are crunchy, but um, it's sort of like eating fruit and granola at the same time. And they're um, very, uh, very nutritious. And if you plant them, you'll also get the Gulf fritillary uh, that will uh, uh, lay eggs. And, and also you'll wonder what's eating my, my passion vine, but the, the Gulf fritillary. So here's a favorite of mine. I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but uh, this is Phasioa, pineapple guava. It's not native. You're not going to find this one in the woods, but it is a subtropical guava-like fruit that has a flavor that I like better than guava. Uh, and uh, then the blooms are, uh, are really pretty on it. These are, they're small blooms, so they're not as big as they look here, but, uh, but they are beautiful and edible. And there are ornamental varieties that have smaller fruit but larger blooms. Uh, I recommend if you're growing it for the fruit that you get one of the larger fruited varieties. So we're going to move on to just some of the types of challenges you might face. You're going to grow fruits in Alabama. Uh, late spring frost is probably our number one challenge for commercial fruit growers and for homeowners too uh, on, a, on many fruits, certainly with peaches, plums, blueberries, strawberries, those early bloomers. Drought, you know, in any given year, drought can be a problem. And so it's good to plan to irrigate. Diseases and insects are always a challenge in Alabama with our heat and humidity. And so um, it's just one of the things that we can learn how to manage with any given fruit, but certain ones have fewer insect and disease pests. Weeds are always a concern and wildlife damage can be very limiting. If you have squirrels, deer, raccoons, uh, birds, you know, that can be a real problem, but there are ways to try to deter them, just like we talked about the fruit bags and we'll talk about some others. Now, if you're going to grow fruit, it's very important that you understand something about the pollination requirements of that given fruit. And um, so we'll just start by saying some fruits are self-fruitful. They don't require po cross-pollination. And here's a list, peaches, strawberries, blackberries, figs, bunch grapes, citrus. Uh, some are um, basically self-fruitful, that is, uh, and parthenocarpic, so persimmons would be an example. They don't require a pollinator, they don't require pollination, and they'll make seedless fruit. Um, and then other fruit crops are partially or totally self-unfruitful, and they do require pollen from another variety, and you're going to need to plant at least two different varieties uh, of many of these apples, pears, plums, blueberries, female muscadine grapes, kiwi fruit, pecans. Now several of those have varieties that are partially self-fruitful we'll say. And so there are some apples or blueberries or plums uh, that you could plant and only plant one variety like methylene plump. You only have room for one variety, one tree, one plum tree. 
uh, then we can help you to find a variety that's self fruitful. Methylene is a good one. Um, if you only had room for one muscadine grapevine, you need to plant a perfect flowered variety. That means you have male and female flower parts and it's self fertile. Now, some of the large uh, muscadines are female varieties. And, uh, and if you only planted one variety and it was female, you'll never make any fruit. So, so pollination is important. You want to study up on your variety, your individual variety, to be sure what pollination requirements it is. Uh, on fruits, they all like some good, uh, uh, well-drained soil. Most all fruits do not want to be in a wet or soggy uh, soil, a heavy clay soil. They don't like that. So they need good water drainage, and uh, they also need good air drainage. So um, that helps with uh, spring freezes. It also helps with diseases. So uh, sometimes getting those fruit up on a higher elevation relative to the land around it, up on a ridge, uh, is better than down in a bowl, for example, uh, where there's not good air circulation. So you'll find, for example, in Chilton County, where all the peaches are grown, you'll find those orchards are planted up on the ridge tops, on the high elevations relative to what's around it. And those lower lying frost pockets are um, not planted in peaches. And if they are, they won't be in peaches very long. So um, because they tend to freeze out uh, in a in a spring freeze, that cold air settles. It's denser than warm air and it settles to the low spots. And so soil test uh, is very important and uh, you may need lime, but I'll say this, if you're gonna grow blueberries, do not lime that area that you, if you ever think you're gonna grow blueberries in it, you don't wanna lime uh, the blueberries. We'll come to that. Full sun, very important. And plan to irrigate if you can. Um, you'll have much better success if you uh, plan in advance to irrigate. Now, you don't have to irrigate, but oftentimes in that first year, um, we need to make sure that we keep something like blueberries, for example, irrigated uh, to get through that first year after planting. Uh, and they'll do better if they're irrigated each summer. Um, we want to soil test in advance of planting. This is very important because we'll learn what our pH is. We can adjust the pH. We get the fertility right for each individual fruit crop uh, that you're going to grow. And some of the fertilizer uh, and lime, for example, we're going to incorporate into the soil before we plant. So as we're establishing the orchard, we'll try to get that phosphorus down in the soil because it doesn't move. Once it's applied to the soil, it binds to the clay. It doesn't move around. So we try to plow that or till it into the root zone ahead of planting. A little bit about training and pruning. Um, it's very important um, that we train these young fruit plants, trees, whatever, to build a structure uh, that we can hang a lot of fruit on. So we're going to try it each individual type of fruit has a, a particular structure that works best. We'll talk a little bit about that. And so training is in those formative years and then the pruning is something we'll do annually to keep it in, in the right uh, uh, healthy uh, you know, uh, growth and, and that sort of thing. So why do we prune? Very important. If you're gonna grow fruit, um, you're gonna make more fruit if uh, we prune appropriately. Now, some fruits don't require much pruning, but there are some reasons why we prune. To encourage abundant fruiting wood, uh, it uh, basically can help you to make more fruit by getting more sunlight in on the wood, and therefore you will develop fruiting buds that will produce your flowers and your fruit. So sunlight uh, increases fruiting. So we want to develop those fruitful branches and direct energy into the right place. And it's important to know with each individual fruit type where the fruit is produced. Uh, on some varieties, fruit is produced on one year old wood, last season's wood. So on peaches, for example. So the, the limbs start growing out this year, let's say in 2020, and uh, about this time of year in August, it's putting on, it'll start putting on blooms, or that is um, fruit blossom or flower buds will be initiated 
that will bloom and fruit next year. So it's important to know where is the fruiting wood uh, in a fig, for example, figs are produced on the current season's wood. So if we go in and do a lot of pruning, uh, it's important to know where the where the the fruit buds are in the tree. So for example, if you pruned all of the ends of your apple limbs off, many of your apple fruits are at the terminals of those uh, twigs. You would prune off all your fruit. Wonder why you didn't make any fruit, for example. So. And then uh, just getting a good angle on your wood. If the if you in a pear tree you want to grow straight up, for example, that's not very fruitful. So we prune limbs to uh, try to get more of a like a 45 degree angle, and that'll uh, give you uh, better uh, fruiting. Let's see. Um, and of course, we want to remove any diseased or dead wood out when we're pruning. So. Just now we're going to move on to a little bit of some of these varieties that are easy to grow. And so I just made a stab at kind of ranking what I think are some of the easier ones to grow, starting at the top left. Oriental persimmon's a favorite, and then this feijoa pineapple guava that I'll show you, uh, figs, mulberries, muscadines, blueberries, blackberries. I've even got serviceberry in there, which is kind of like a blueberry growing on a tree is the way I describe it. So, um, but a, a, a native plant that, that you can grow here. If you want to grow uh, apples and pears, the fire blight resistant ones are going to be easier to grow and on down this list. And now at the bottom right, you'll even see some cold hardy citrus varieties. There are some varieties of citrus that you can grow in your yard uh, without cold protection and, uh, and make fruit. Um, they're, um, so just something to know, um, and we can talk about that if you have questions. So increasing the difficulty then starts going down this list of plums and sour. Sour cherries are easier to grow. Uh, uh, sweet cherries, very difficult for us to, to grow and fruit for a variety of reasons. You can grow them, but you won't make fruit very often. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so we're just kind of moving through this list. And we're gonna start with my favorite, uh, our family favorite. I don't know if you know this fruit, but this is Oriental persimmon, uh, also known as Japanese persimmon. Um, and uh, this particular one, you can see it's a large tree and it was actually grafted onto a wild persimmon rootstock. Our native persimmon, uh, Thalsparis virginiana, uh, is the rootstock. It was just growing wild and we grafted onto it. So here's the fruit of Diospyrus virginiana, the um, our wild persimmon. I don't know if any of y'all have ever been tricked into uh, trying it before it had lost its astringency, but uh, growing up, that was a favorite uh, a favorite thing for us to do. And uh, I tricked my wife Becky into trying some, uh, <laughs> and I thought she'd never eat another persimmon. But uh, so it's a wonderful fruit after it loses its astringency when it's fully ripe, but before, wow, it is powerful. Um, so here is a, a oriental persimmon. This is one of the Fuyu varieties and, and you can see just wonderful fall color. Um, certain varieties color up better than others and uh, in certain years they can have tremendous color and the fruit is always just amazing. They glow just like iridescent orange in the, in the fall sunset. And um, so it's just an all time favorite of our families. And you can see why it's just beautiful fruit and it's easy to grow. And uh, you can harvest them when they are uh, firm and uh, sort of a, a light orange color and they can be crisp like an apple or you can let them hang on the tree until they are just turned into a translucent red bag of juice, just like sugar water, uh, so sweet. And, um, and, and, and that's the way my wife Becky likes to eat them right there and, and she'll make persimmon bread and such with that. Uh, so here's some varieties and I would just say this, notice astringent versus non-astringent varieties. I would recommend you buy non-astringent varieties like Fuyu and Wasi Fuyu or uh, Gyro or Giro. Uh, and so, uh, and there are astringent varieties, I'll just say um, that um, I would recommend that you pay attention to if you're buying persimmons. The non-astringent ones you can eat crisp like an apple uh, when the, they're in this stage shown in the picture and uh, and they're mildly sweet or you can let them go to full ripeness and, and they'll never have 
uh, as much as a hint of astringency, but the astringent varieties will be highly astringent until they're fully ripe. And, uh, and one problem you're going to have on all fruits, uh, and you certainly will have problems on persimmons, is wildlife damage. And uh, this uh, you see here's uh, bird pecking, crows, mockingbirds, for example, love fruit and uh, and they they really work on it as well as deer and uh, and if you'd like to attract wildlife I'd like to say they will come um, but uh, and, and they'll prune reprune your trees for you so there's some challenges uh, you know if you have wildlife around uh, other you know kinds of things that you can do uh, we mentioned uh, earlier the bagging, but mylar flash tape or holographic tape or bird scare tape. Uh, there's also what I call scary eye balloons. So you can find them listed as scare eye. And uh, bird netting we use as well. So just a, a you know, variety of things you can do uh, to try to keep wildlife off your fruit. And I'll just say this about persimmon. So on persimmon fruit harvest, um, that harvest can stretch from September through December, depending on the varieties you have, even longer. And, um, and the fruit can be held on the tree and harvested as needed. So it's really nice to be able to walk out in the yard from September to December and pick fruit, uh, you know, and eat it, you know, right in the yard if you want to. Uh, we'll say that after hard freezes, we get down, you know, deep below freezing, uh, the fruit quality declines as those uh, persimmons will freeze, but they can withstand some light freezes. And uh, one of the things we like to do is dry our persimmons, and you can dry them, candy them, and, and a lot of things. And so we dry them and uh, and, and just uh, have a lot of, of success with, with drying fruits, and, and persimmons dry really well, as do apples and other things. I did show you that large picture of uh, John Neighbors, my good friend's uh, oil and persimmon tree. And that was just a, a Japanese oil and persimmon variety grafted onto a wild native uh, uh, persimmon rootstock, like you see here. And uh, very easy to propagate those if you have some wild persimmons growing on your property. Uh, you can see how large trees can grow on that rootstock. So we'll talk a little bit about muscadines. Um, muscadines are much easier to grow than are the uh, bunch grapes, generally speaking. And um, so I would just say that, you know, we, we mentioned before that if you're going to grow muscadines, you need to pay attention to the type you have, because if you're only going to plant one variety, then you need a perfect flowered variety. That's one that's self-fertile. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, if you plant a female variety, you must plant a pollinator with it. Now, if you're going to grow muscadines, muscadines um, you're going to need to plan to prune, and, uh, and, a, and a trellis is helpful with that. And uh, so a lot of ways you can grow them. And uh, my uh, recommendation is that you get you some good quality pruners and be prepared and don't let it get ahead of you. Uh, you're going to need to prune them every year because you'll put on a lot of growth, you know, in any given year. This is the way I like to grow them. It's very easy, uh, simple, and uh, all you have to do is basically cut those long runners, which we uh, call uh, those um, arms that come down, the fruiting spurs that come, come off. We will prune those back um, and, uh, and leave uh, just a very short, uh, two, three, four buds on each fruiting spur, and uh, it's a simple way to prune. Very easy to maintain them on a single wire trellis. So here are some favorites of mine. Bronze muscadines, I think, are just amazing. Uh, and, uh, my favorite variety is Darlene. And down at the bottom here, you can see some self-fruitful varieties with the asterisks. So uh, varieties uh, like late fry or hall, for example, if you were only going to plant one muscadine. Now, if you wanted to plant one bronze and one black muscadine, which is a great idea, they can pollinate each other. And, um, and so you can choose from a lot of great varieties. Um, I would say this, the black varieties have fewer fruit rot problems than the bronze. 
and um, so their flavor is a little different. So I like both uh, for flavor, uh, but I especially like the fact that I have fewer spots on my black muscadines. And here's an, uh, sort of a different one. It's a cross, a hybrid uh, between uh, Summit Muscadine and a Vinifera uh, grape. And uh, this has a, a pretty ornamental cut leaf and good flavor. It's called Southern Home, which I think is an ornamental grape. And, and uh, then something that I think is kind of interesting, there are some seedless muscadine varieties that have been developed in recent years. Uh, we used to have one for many years called uh, uh, fry, seedless fry, and it was not very fruitful. But in recent years, uh, Jeff Bloodworth, a breeder who uh, is working with Gardens Alive, has developed several varieties. Erasmataz is one uh, that you see here that, uh, that fruits well and is seedless. It's, um, and another one is Oh My, it's a bronze muscadine and uh, seedless as well. And, and there are uh, several other varieties that he's working on that, um, and so these varieties just keep getting better and better. So, so I like to throw in new varieties so you'll, you'll get some ideas of what's coming down the line. We'll talk about that some more. Um, so blueberries are certainly one of the options that we can grow that are well adapted in Alabama. Uh, and, um, and I would recommend that you grow rabbit eye type blueberries and we have lots of good varieties to choose from. The uh, southern high bush varieties uh, can be grown but they're more difficult so I certainly would recommend you start out with the rabbit eye types and, and so here are some different varieties that you can grow. Generally speaking most blueberries are going to need a pollinator uh, and, uh, and so it's a good idea to plant two or more varieties that bloom at the same time and you can get some early mid-season and late varieties so that you can spread out your harvest season. And one of my favorites for flavor is Yadkin. That's a North Carolina state. Uh, Jim Ballington was the breeder. Uh, and uh, that variety is a, a nice flavor. I've got several of those at home and, uh, and really like them. And then we have some very large fruited uh, blueberries as well. And one of the largest ones is Titan. Uh, it's a very large uh, fruit if you are interested in that. Yeah, one of the most important things if you're going to grow blueberries is you need an acidic soil pH. So don't ever lime the soil where you're going to plant your blueberries. Um, it would be good to soil test and be sure that your pH is in the right range. And that 4.5 to 5.2 is, is uh, where you want your soil pH. If uh, your pH is too high, you can add sulfur to lower it. Um, and then it's just very important uh, when you plant them that you get some organic matter mixed in with your, uh, uh, with your native soil. And we like to mix it throughout the bed and we mix in peat moss, also uh, bark mulch, pine bark mulch is commonly mixed in. I'll show you a picture of that. And it's very important to keep those plants uh, watered during dry periods. Um, and let me, uh, and then I'll just mention, of course, mulching, very important. So I'll show you a couple of pictures. Uh, Don, uh, if you're uh, able to answer just a question, I'm seeing that we had some raised hands. And um, so I'm curious if you want to uh, answer questions now or um, take questions at the, uh, the end of the presentation. We can take some questions now. Um, I have a few that are in the chat. Just let me scroll okay. through that real quick okay someone asks when should bags be put on what stage of fruit development yeah that's a great question so the recommendation is um and you'll get better results if you manage uh insect and diseases uh for about the first um three weeks or so uh maybe four weeks uh by that time let's say on a peach tree the fruit will be up about the size of a ping pong ball and you can actually get the bag around the fruit. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, so our pathologists and entomologists would recommend that you put on it, whether organic or conventional sprays uh, before you bag. So, um, uh, so basically we're trying to control some insect and disease problems uh, in that first month or so. So you can do some pest management there. Uh, if you don't want to spray anything at all, you certainly can wait and, and hopefully you're, you still have clean fruit. 
but it's entirely possible that you've got some some um, you know insect disease challenges if you don't spray. Uh, so, but about a month after. Um, that fruit begins to form. It's big enough that you could then tie the bag on and then you don't have to do any more spraying after that. I hope that answered that question. Have you had any luck with growing sugar mountain sweet berry honey, honeysuckle or Japanese hasca? Yeah, um, we are growing some at the Chilton Research and Extension Center. And my coworker, Dr. Edgar Vinson, put those in a couple of years ago or three. Um, and, uh, and I'm not sure how they're doing right now, but, um, but I can put you in touch. You can contact me and, uh, and we can talk with Edgar and, uh, or you can come down and see those growing at the Chilton Research and Extension Center in Clanton. Uh, and we do have some planted there. And uh, that would be one of the fruits that you could potentially also see if you came to our Ag Showcase and Fruit Tasting. The last question I have is, I live in central Georgia. What variety of pecan would do well here and where can I buy them? And she would right. prefer a larger pecan size. Yeah, okay, that's a great question. Um, and uh, at the end of this presentation, I had a couple of slides, but we may not see them uh, uh, today, but I would just mention uh, by scab resistant varieties. So if you grow pecans and you're gonna plant trees, get scab resistant varieties, pecan scab resistant varieties, and, um, and that will help you. And if you can plant two varieties that, um, that would pollinate each other, you'll increase your production as well. But the scab resistant, scab is the number one disease that limits pecan production and requires a lot of sprays by commercial growers. Uh, and so, um, you can get a variety like um, Syrup Mill or Jenkins or McMillan. Um, those are uh, a few. Gafford is another. Um, and uh, I'll be glad to share that information with you as well, um, you know, after the presentation. Okay. Scab resistant varieties on pecans, very important. There's one more question. Um, what is the latest month to fertilize blueberries with chlorosis? Yeah, okay. So I'll show a slide here in just a second. We'll get to see what that looks like. The idea there is um, with iron chlorosis, um, the problem is oftentimes that your pH is too high. And, um, and so iron's not readily available. So I would recommend you do a, a soil test and see what your pH is. And then you're probably going to want to uh, not only fertilize your blueberries, uh, which is what we're talking about now, um, but also add sulfur. So we want to use an acidifying fertilizer like an amelia, azalea camellia fertilizer, but, uh, and then we would also add sulfur to try to lower the pH if indeed your pH is too high. So, um, and, and so following that question, I'll just mention, so we're recommending that you fertilize two or three times a year, just lightly, not too much, with an azalea camellia fertilizer. And uh, because for, you can overdo it with blueberries and uh, get into a, a problem and burn them. So when we plant our blueberries, we're gonna add in compost, pine bark mulch, that sort of thing. Uh, we, if your soil pH is high, we may be adding sulfur at that point uh, as well into the bed. And um, then we recommend that you top the plant. If it's, it's the big plant with only a few roots, a bare root, for example, then re reducing the plant size. Uh, make sure you irrigate. And, um, and then a little bit, just a little bit of pruning on blueberries. You don't have to do too much, but uh, they do respond well to pruning. So remember, sunlight, getting sunlight on that wood means that you're gonna make more fruit and um, so while you don't have to do a lot of pruning on blueberries, they respond well and you will make more fruit uh, if you do some pruning. So opening up the center, getting sunlight down inside, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, if you have any low hanging you know, limbs like you see there, we're gonna prune those off. And, um, and so basically uh, making sure we've got plenty of sunlight uh, they do like organic, you know, matter, uh, compost, pine bark mulch mixed into the soil. Uh, we, we grow ours up on berms, uh, and they do well that way. If they've got drip irrigation, 
uh, then that, that really helps. And, um, but you can grow them even with uh, a small berm or, or even on level ground. Uh, it's very helpful if you'll manage uh, your weed control. So whether you uh, mulch uh, or hoe or spray with a herbicide, um, weed control is very helpful on, uh, on your blueberries. And so we were talking about iron chlorosis. And iron chlorosis, just, it just means uh, that the leaves are chlorotic or this yellowing between the veins on the new growth. So if your new leaves look like this, that's telling you that your pH is too high and the iron in the soil is not readily available. Um, and so you might see that same look on your gardenias, camellias, azaleas, any acid loving plant it looks uh, uh, like this is telling you that your pH is too high. So that's um, what we were referring to with iron chlorosis. Uh, Don, if you see any other questions, you can just chime in or we can, you know, be glad to, to answer all the questions we need to at the end of the presentation as well. There uh, are no questions right now. Um, so if you need to keep going, just keep good. going. I'll yeah. let you know. All right. So we still got a lot to, to look at, so I'm going to go fast. But if you see disease like this, uh, this stem canker from Bacteria spiri, we're going to prune that out. And when you prune it out, then go below it as much as you can, maybe a foot below it if you can, prune it out and sterilize your pruners. And that way you don't spread it around in the plant. We'll talk about figs a little bit. So here's some favorite varieties, a lot of great varieties we can grow. We, our figs are fruiting here at the, uh, here at the uh, Botanical Gardens and also the Experiment Station. And we have a lot of great varieties. Um, and uh, one of my favorites is this one, Green Ischia. It's like grass green on the outside and strawberry red on the inside. It's a late fig, and, um, but it is a really sweet fig and, uh, and a favorite. Now, a new problem we have every year, we've got a new insect or disease, unfortunately. And so uh, three, four years ago, uh, African fig fly showed up. And, um, and so it's a new fruit fly. Uh, and, uh, and it's a large one. It's easy to recognize from these white stripes on it. And um, it, uh, it infests figs, and you can see here it's on grapes, um, and, um, and that can cause your fruit to, uh, to spoil, drop off. You wonder why your fruit are spoiling. That might be uh, your challenge right there. They'll lay little white eggs around the, the edge of an eye, uh, Figs have an open eye at the bottom and some varieties have a closed eye. And so if you notice that there's a little, um, little spot at the bottom that has a, a little opening, that's an open eye fig, and they're more likely to sour uh, on you. So I do make sure that I've got some closed eye fig varieties and they don't sour as badly. If you grow figs, you might wonder, you know, why are my figs falling off the tree? Or why are they just sitting there and they're staying green and they won't ripen up. And um, so fruit drop can be caused when the trees get too vigorous, if you over fertilize or if we get too dry or hot, or if you have some nematode problems. And also if the fruit is just sitting there green, not ripening, uh, it'll do that during a drought, for example. And if you will just irrigate, and one way you can do that is just lay your hose pipe under the plant and let it drip. And if you if you'll do that, you'll notice those figs will ripen right up. Uh, so they do have a, just a few preferences. Uh, they need some water, and just like we were talking about, especially during drought. Um, they uh, they appreciate some mulch. That'll help, uh, especially with drought and cold protection. Um, and I'll mention at the bottom down there. Um, well, uh, I guess the third one, we don't want to plant them in a cold location. They'll freeze out and you'll wonder why they're dying back to the ground every year. Um, and then we don't want to over fertilize uh, and that especially after midsummer. So basically no fertilizer, no nitrogen fertilizer on our figs after midsummer will help reduce some of our problems with them freezing out. They're easy to prune and, and, and basically we just prune them to an open center. My good friend, Dr. Arlie Powell here at Petals from the Past, great resource. Uh, and uh, so I'd encourage you if, you know, if you're looking for fruits and, and want to learn about fruits, uh, Dr. Powell has a lot of great programs and, and, and great fruit varieties. Um, 
we'll just uh, move on to apples and and we'll also talk about pears uh, as well. So um, this is a variety that we uh, grew called black twig. It's, uh, I would say, moderate fire blight resistance and a good cider uh, or juice apple. Uh, really a tremendous flavor when it's fully ripe. Uh, but it's starchy before it gets fully ripe. That's the way a lot of the cider apples are. Um, <clears throat> you can get spur type and non-spur type apples. And then rootstock is very important. So some varieties are more dwarfing rootstock. Um, some of the rootstocks that are uh, more dwarfing may also impart some fire blight uh, resistance. And so that's rootstock is a very important thing to consider when you're buying fruit plants, especially apples. Um, and so a lot of good varieties we can choose from that are well adapted here in the south. And uh, this particular one is the one that I showed you earlier that I harvested today, the, the uh, Callaway crab. And, um, it, and although it's not without its problems, it does get some fruit rots and that sort of thing, but it's a beautiful ornamental tree with edible uh, fruit. And, uh, and so I, I like them personally. And then uh, pears and Asian pears are just some tremendous uh, fruit that we can grow here. Uh, that mildly sweet, they're, um, in, in my estimation, most of them are not sugary sweet, but some are just wonderful fruit and very juicy. Um, and so here are just some uh, recommendations of some fire blight resistant pears and Asian pears. Um, the European pears or soft pears, I uh, would highly recommend you consider planting Warren and Ayers. They're two of the favorites for flavor. Uh, and certainly our hard pears uh, like kefir. If you see an old home place, it's got an old pear tree on it. Uh, that is most likely a kefir, a hard pear, uh, good for canning. And then uh, a couple of Asian pear varieties, Korean Giant and Shinko are, are two good ones to consider. Uh, and uh, Korean Giant is more fire blight resistant. Shinko has fire blight tolerance and, and you do need two varieties so you'll have a pollinizer. Uh, good thing to keep in mind there. Hey Gary, we have a question. Yes. Okay, great. Would you recommend the Southern Living Fruit Trees? Um, Brian just purchased one of their dwarf figs. Yeah, um, so it would depend on the variety. I would say probably they're, they're probably, you know, all good recommended varieties. I just don't know what all varieties they have. Uh, and, um, but uh, I would say this, if you ever have, you know, a variety question, I'm, you know, if you can tell me the variety, I'm glad, Brian, to help, uh, you know, tell you what I know about that, help you research if it's well adapted. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, if you know what variety is, uh, just let me know uh, which one that is. Um, you know, we were talking about figs earlier, and I don't know. I did show some slides with some several varieties there. Chances are your fig is in that list of varieties. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, we just uh, and if you have another question, just just let me know. We've got a few more minutes. I think actually, Don, you tell me. We are at twelve thirty three. Um, what, what do you want to do, Don? I think you're good to keep going. Um, right. If anyone has to leave at any point, just remember that we're recording this, so you'll be able to hear all of the questions and answers. And you will also um, be able to go back and hear anything that you missed if you have to leave at 1230. And I have a couple of people who have their hands raised. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why, though. All right, let me, let me raise. Could you please come in the chat and let us know why you raised your hand? Yeah, that's good. You can give the questions to Don on chat. And Don, if we could, I'd probably like to zip through the last of these slides and then take questions. And that way we won't leave, uh, leave some stuff on touched uh, if that's possible. So I think okay. in probably, I'm thinking five minutes, we can probably get to the end of this. I'll just zip through. So fire blight is the disease problem we're looking at here. Very important in apples and pears, crab apples, quince. Um, so we want you to get resistant, fire blight resistant varieties. If you're only planting a few, 
Uh, and that will increase your chances of making fruit and your fruit living and you don't have to spray as much and prune as much. But, um, and then, you know, if you want to try some fire blight susceptible varieties, oh, there are plenty to choose from that are wonderful to eat. They're just not as easy to grow. So this list is helpful. And then just some thoughts about training in apples and pears. And I'll just say this, on the picture on the right, you can see some limb spreaders. And I would highly encourage you if you're growing apples and pears, we want to prune out the, that very straight up growth. We're going to select growth that's outward and more like a 45 degree angle. And we're going to use limb spreaders to push those limbs out and keep them out at a strong crotch angle like that. So you can see the example here when little bitty limbs are starting to grow on your apples and pears, you can push those little limbs out with a toothpick or a clothespin. And uh, then as they grow more, put a limb spreader on it and, um, and that'll give you nice, strong crotch angles. The up, more upright uh, fruiting wood um, is, uh, it, it's very vigorous. It, it, uh, it's not well attached. It'll break out and it doesn't bear as much fruit. So, so what we're doing here is trying to get those limbs out at more of a 45 degree angle. So just touch on blackberries and raspberries. Raspberries don't like our heat. Now we can grow some raspberries. They don't perineate or live as long as blackberries do. But uh, so we're gonna talk more about blackberries in a few minutes we have. Um, thorny varieties, if you wanna grow a blackberry that's very disease resistant and will live a long time, Kiowa is, uh, is a good variety to grow. And, um, and you can see that one growing at petals from the past. Uh, they in there you pick they have a lot of kiowa that's the primary variety they grow because of its disease resistance uh however we have lots of wonderful thornless blackberry varieties uh, many of these being developed out of the university of arkansas program and uh and i just mentioned so wachita is the most popular and most highly sold blackberry variety probably in maybe in, i don't know well in, in recent years, they've sold more, 5 million uh, plants of this Ouachita, and it just last week got the 2020 Outstanding Fruit Cultivar Award. So it's a good one. Um, now, the newest one that's just been developed uh, is the sweetest blackberry. It's called Ponca. And, uh, and then, so if you like a sweet fruit, then uh, it shouldn't be too long before you can find Ponca uh, out there and may be able to buy it online now. Thornless blackberry varieties. Here's Wachita, and you can see how it looks, and it's a very nice variety. Um, the, the thornless varieties uh, are going to be susceptible to diseases and viruses and things, and uh, Kiowa can t tolerate viruses live a long time. The thornless varieties won't live as long, uh, but they're easy to, easy to handle. So here's pineapple guava, and I mentioned it earlier, and I just I personally uh, like it a lot because we grow it at the experiment station. I grow it at home and uh, we don't do anything to it much. And uh, it makes fruit and lots of fruit uh, every fall. And so uh, there are just some wonderful things you can do with it. You can, certainly can uh, use it like a guava. Uh, we, I like to eat them fresh, uh, but uh, you can make guava jam, for example. This is a tropical feijoa lime jam that uh, is really nice blooms look like this like we showed before and they're edible as well and uh, and there are some varieties listed here that are good varieties to grow nazimuts is one of the ones that is self-fertile um, but you will do better if you have two varieties that can pollinize each other and uh, certainly pomegranates are a beautiful fruit that we can grow and have some nice varieties you can see a couple of different varieties here these are at petals from the past we also grow them at our Shelton Research and Extension Center, have a uh, trial there. We also grow golden kiwi fruit there. And, um, and it is, uh, if you wanna grow kiwi fruit, uh, I highly recommend you grow golden. You can harvest them right off the vine in September. And uh, it's um, a, a much superior fruit to the green kiwi fruit. The skin is almost fuzzless, so you can eat skin and all. And uh, so, uh, just important to know that you do need a male pollinator or pollinizer variety um, to grow kiwi fruit and it grows like kudzu and so you need a strong trellis preferably or someplace where it can grow and uh, there's a lot of pruning 
involved. It's not the easiest fruit to grow, and so that's one reason why I end with kiwi fruit. But uh, but it is a nice and it's delicious. But uh, stink bugs uh, and some diseases are challenges. But uh, pollination is a challenge. But uh, these are two varieties we developed at Auburn: AU Golden Dragon and AU Golden Sunshine, and they are very nice varieties of uh, of golden kiwi fruit. So with that, we can take some questions uh, if you have any, and I'll just show you my contact information here as well before we drop the screen share. So uh, any questions? Don, are you still with us? Uh, I don't hear you, Don. I think your mic may be muted. Sorry, I'm back. Okay. Um, so we have two questions, and I think you may have answered one of them, but someone wanted to know if pineapple guava would grow in North Alabama. Great question. Okay. Um, it grows wonderful in Central Alabama. Um, you know, and there might be somebody on with us that knows the answer to that. I'm trying to think the furthest north that I'm familiar with. Um, you know, I would say it would be worth a try. Um, I don't remember how low it can go on temperature, um, but I have not seen a problem with it um, in the years that I've dealt with it. So it, it may be able to, it, you know, I guess if you're in extreme North Alabama or if you're at a high elevation, you know, there may be some challenges, but, um, but uh, yeah, I'd give it a try. I sure would. Um, Brian asked the question more specifically for me. Um, so I don't have to give you all instructions about how to access the recorded version. What's going to happen is I'm sending it to our marketing team and they're going to edit it a little bit and add it to YouTube. So if you follow us follow us on Facebook, you'll be able to see the YouTube version there, but I'm also going to send you an email with a survey link, um, the YouTube version link, and then also a PDF version of Gary's um, presentation. So Gary, I'm going to come get that from you in about 10 minutes or so. All right. Okay. Um, because we just want to send that information to them so that they can have it if they didn't watch uh, or they weren't here for the video. Okay. And we have some questions in the chat. So let's see. Um, my chat is acting a little crazy. Yeah, okay, I'm looking too. So, um, so some uh, Dal Dahlia says thank you. Oh. Sarah says thank you. Excellent, excellent information. And Eric would like to for you to recommend growing strawberries or other fruit in containers in Birmingham. Yeah, yeah. Strawberries grow great in containers, especially if you have like a strawberry pot, you know, or a basket. Um, one of the reasons I like them in containers is, you know, they're up off the ground. We have less disease and insect challenges. So uh, yeah, they grow great in containers. Um, in my experience, I grow strawberries out, you know, in the garden as well. And I tend to have slugs and dried fruit beetles and, and, and some disease challenges and things. So um, I grow them both ways. And uh, yeah, you certainly can do that. All right. All right, now all I see is a lot of so good and thank yous. Um, and good. we still have people falling off so yeah so um i see one that says um from chris um i have two percentage trees growing together they make tiny fruit what is the latest month to fertilize blueberries with roses? okay so i missed the first part of that um if if the persimmons grow together and they make tiny fruit they may be our native persimmon uh the uh, diaspirus virginiana and um that's the american persimmon and um and and so that's my guess as to why you have tiny fruit. Now there are Asian or Oriental persimmons, uh, like Saijo, that make small fruit. Um, and um, you know, so, uh, but uh, 
anyway, so that may be what that is and the latest month to fertilize we talked about earlier. Really, what you want to do on fertilization blueberries about two to three times a year. So if we can fertilize early, that's about time bud break. You're starting to see some growth. Uh, and then um, uh, maybe a month after that, so at that point they're, you know, they're blooming, fruiting, and then after harvest. So that after harvest fertilization is very helpful with most fruit crops, um, but especially with blueberries, um, because we're going to harvest them, then we're going to fertilize and get some vigorous growth that will produce buds, flower buds for next year's crop. So um, that also applies to blackberries, for example. We harvest blackberries uh, a little different. We harvest blackberries, pick the berry off, and we want to, when you pick the last berry off that individual cane, we want to cut that cane out because it is a it's already two years old. It's going to die after it fruits, and it has a lot of disease on it. So as soon as we pick the last berry off that individual cane, we cut that whole branch out all the way down to where it originates at the ground. And we'll have new young canes coming up, which will be our fruit fruiting canes for next year. Okay. Any, um, other, any other questions? Someone noted that they've seen strawberries growing in vertical containers and rows commercially. Yes. Yeah. Um, so strawberries grow well in, we, there are a couple different ways that we can grow them. Uh, either um, uh, one way, for example, in, in greenhouses, for example, we'll grow them this way sometimes in trays, almost like gutters and, and uh, hydroponically. But, um, but they can also be grown uh, upright, vertically, uh, in um, basically th these uh, plug plants basically are being grown in um, um, a hydroponic system with a wick and uh, nutrient solution, and they grow well like that as well. Um, and you can grow them in soil as, you know, um, in either of those methods if you're able to maintain your uh, irrigation and and you can fertilize through your irrigation system uh, as well. Any suggestions? Oh, wait, there's a question before that. Yeah. What's the best time yeah. to grow strawberries? Yeah, okay. So different ways to do it, but you, we can, you can, they're perennial plants. Um, you can get them uh, and plant them in the spring or plant them in, uh, in the fall. Uh, and uh, whenever you can get the plants, you can plant them. Um, and uh, a lot of people, gardeners, might plant them in the spring and then they'll grow through and might uh, fruit in the summer depending on the type of uh, plants that you have. However, uh, many of our strawberry plants and our uh, commercial growers will plant them in the fall. They plant them in September, October. A lot of our strawberries go in in October. Uh, and, um, and they will plant them uh, and then harvest that fruit in um, April and May uh, of uh, the following spring. So if you can get your plants and plant them in the fall, that's the way most of, all of our commercial growers do it. And, uh, and they tend to plant on uh, plastic culture raised beds. You've probably seen those, um, but, uh, but you don't have to plant them that way at all. Suggestions for caterpillars that stripped all the leaves off blueberry bushes. Yeah, we have some caterpillars that will certainly do that on blueberries and and um, the um, uh, You can pick them off, you know, the most organic option available um, Then there are uh, another organic option is uh, BT or Dipel bacillus thuringiensis is good for a lot of caterpillars, but it's not toxic to humans so uh, or, or other insects. So like we were talking uh, earlier about trying to protect our bees uh, If we can use Dipel that would be one of the safest options probably um, and uh, for other beneficials uh, let's see, and, um, and, and then there, you know, um, uh, yeah, so, so those are the, the kinds of options you've got. Uh, it, you do need to keep a close eye on those. Um, so if, uh, uh, if, any other questions, Dolph? I don't see any on this end. Um, okay. But Edna just did say thank you about the caterpillar suggestion. Yeah, okay, sure, Edna. 
I think that's it for us. Um, you should be getting a knock on your door soon from Jamie. Yeah, I already have one. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, well, let me just say this, Don. Um, if I can ever help any of you that have participated today or your friends uh, with um, your questions, I would be glad to do that. Would be very interested to help you anytime. If you're going to put in uh, some fruit plantings, uh, I want to help you on the front end to make good variety choices and that sort of thing, so you'll be successful in your uh, in your endeavors. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today, and thank you Gary for being here. I really appreciate it. Sure thing, Don. Glad to help.